brother? Just truly blessed. Okay. That's enough. That's enough. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thanks, Steve. I'm, uh, for those, I have, I'm going to do something tonight I can't say that I've ever done before. That must be why you're here. Must be why you're here. I've been, um, I was trying to think back how many years it's been that I've been trying to teach through the word, you know. And um, I remember years ago when I was young, there was a guy on the radio by the name of McGee. Oh, yeah. And uh, he had a radio program that was called Through the Bible. And what it was was he would go through the Bible, he would teach through the Bible. And uh, uh, he'd, he'd just de take it, um, basically um, take it verse by verse and and in that and begin to teach through the Bible. And, and um, I always kind of liked that way of doing it. You know, and I, 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 th I think sometimes you still, excuse me, may be able to uh, hear him on the radio. I'm, I'm sure there's some radio stations that, that do that. But I, I, I think over the years, I, I can't tell you how many how many times I've taught the Bible? Two Bible, two 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 basic uh, parts of the Bible that I that I haven't spent much time teaching on was one was the Book of Revelation, and uh, it's not that I'm afraid of it. I, I I think about I was 12 years old when I got saved, and the first first book I read was the Book of Revelation, and uh, I thought that as I read that book, you know, when you, when you grow up in a church that teaches everything futuristic, it was always coming someday. It was always there someday. And more as I've taught through the word and got understanding of the word, I began to realize that when God speaks, he doesn't speak out of time. He speaks out of eternity, and out of eternity, he speaks into time. And in that dimension, so it's up to you to be able to discern when he's speaking into and what he's speaking into. And I realized in later years, as I began to study the book of Revelation, that the whole book of Revelation was sealed up in the first five words. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you look into the Greek, there is an article in front of Christ, and it says, this is the revelation of Jesus, the Christ. Okay? And in that revelation, it's an ongoing revelation of who he is. My friend Lynn Hiles, who is probably a little more of a historical teacher than I am, he would tell you that all of it's past. But I say it's all eternal. Are you listening? And I'm, I'm a firm believer that it is not the revelation of, uh, and he says it this way, is bugs as big as Volkswagen's. And, and, and this big fiery red dragon, whatever that is, and all of these things, that those are only signs and symbols of something that's more practical and more real in our lives. And so tonight I'm attempting, I'm gonna attempt to do something I, I can't say that I've ever done before. I probably taught verses out of this book, out of the book of Jude, but I've never really taken it from verse one and worked my way down through it. So I'm not sure how far I'm gonna get. So you say, how long is this gonna take till it's done? That's my answer. 
One of the things I always appreciated about, uh, I'm gonna open my different computer up. Shortly, I'm gonna break down and spend money and buy a better one. This one has got to the point where it's so slow, it takes forever to do anything. So, anyway, um, give me a moment here. I'll get there and it'll open up. Dude one, and I will do something that I usually do. I will go to uh, uh, King James primarily because it's easy here and it's got direct, uh, direct numbering into the Greek and I, I want to do it that way. One of the things I uh, heard Mark Hanby say probably 20 years ago. He called the book of Jude the gateway to Revelation. It's the archway. We've just finished the three epistles of John. And we understand how John looked at things uh, basically. Probably the last writer of the New Testament. And more than likely, he wrote the epistles of John after he wrote Revelation. Are you listening? I've said this, I tried to tell you that when we were, when we were dealing with John. John was somewhere between 90 and 100 years old when he wrote these epistles of John. And so we got to understand that we were closing that century. After, we, after Jesus' his resurrection and after his ascension, we were closing up that century and we're finding out what it was like after we moved Christianity out from under the Jewish influence. And Paul took it over into the Gentile world. They had to deal with it in a Gentile world. And when I look at the church today, when I look at Christianity today, and then I compare it to Christianity in the, these days, in this past period of time, from what we're dealing with right now in the book of Jude maybe, I'm not sure the dating of the book of Jude. There's a lot of speculation. As much speculation as there is about who, who wrote it. But I begin to compare the church. The church started in power in Pentecost. If people lied to the Holy Ghost, they died. We don't have that kind of of spiritual influence, or we don't see it that much. This leads me to another story. I remember Doc telling me when God first called him into the ministry, and he said, I was a little more bold than I was wise. Now, he was always pretty bold as long as I knew him. And, uh, yeah, I seen Doc when he was pretty bold. But he said he held a meeting, and he said the Lord said to him, you're always looking for money because you never have any. And he said, but I'm going to send a lady into this meeting, and she's going to give you $2,000. And and he said, I got up to speak, and the Lord pointed her out and said, that lady right there, I've spoken to her to give you $2,000. And he said, she's got the money in her purse. And I forgot all the details of the story, but she asked for prayer. And Doc said, I went down like the Lord told me to, and he said, I begin to pray. And he said, as I begin to pray, 
He said, the Lord told me she changed her mind. And he said, so when it was all finished, I said to her, you know, the Lord spoke to you to give me a sum of money and you've changed your mind. And she said to Doc, and you're not gonna get it and drop dead. God still deals with people. And I don't know what we would do in this generation because we're so PC. We say, oh, we're not PC. I got news for you. You are. You've been influenced by it. And I compare the church of that age into the Gentile culture that they had to introduce Christianity into. We're just getting a taste of what that kind of culture is in America. Where we just don't dislike people, we hate them for no reason. And immorality is run rampant and it's crept into the church. completely and the church has got to be the answer to the world's issues and so I begin to teach some of these things I find it very difficult because I'm not really sure whether I'm getting the point across or not Kim Because I know what God is after in my life. And I say, I might say, Lord, I want, I, want, I want everything. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, he that tries to save his life is going to lose it. But he that's willing to lose his life for my sake. And when we begin to look at those things, we look at the world we live in. God's been good to us. He's blessed us. My oldest son has a way of saying it. He said, do we want a God life or do we want a good man's life? We say we want a God life, but we think maybe that a God life is just a good man's life. And I can say this, God has given me a good man's life. But it's a God life I want to walk in. Are you listening? I, I'm, I'm not so lack of being Pentecostal that I want to see the sick healed. I want to see the devils cast out. I want to see all of those things be done by a word out of the mouth of a people that are so touched by God that they can transform the city they live in. They can transform the church they go to and all of that. Now, I don't know why I'm ranting on, but I, I'm just trying to say that we find an issue when we get to the book of Jude. And so I don't want to preach the book of Jude. I want to teach a little bit out of it. You, you will let me. So I, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first uh, three verses. Then I want to go back and break it down. So you're going to have to pray for me because you know how I am. I get a thought while I'm reading and then I want to communicate it and and, and that's not what I really have purpose to do tonight. The book of Jude. Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called 
mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. I don't want to go into the next verse. I really don't want to break the next verse down. He goes on and talks about some that have crept in unawares. Say, come on, everybody up here, look up there. Say, that's happened to us. We just weren't aware of it. You want to know why? Because we get soul tied and we never see things spiritually. Are you listening to me? We get soul tied. And we never realize that some things have been happening to us in this present hour that happened to them in that hour. Say, nothing new, nothing new. under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. So let's start with the book of Jude. First thing I would like to say is this. I think. Uh, first thing off, we pronounce it wrong. We always say the J's. And in the Greek, it's Edas or Judas. Okay? It's not just Jew. Jew's kind of like a short for whatever, you know. It's like, it's like, um, uh, you know, you, I, I'm going to pick on Lizzie. Is, is, that, is it okay if I pick on your, her name's Elizabeth, all right? I call her Blue Eyes. But, but, the, but the issue is, for sure, somebody's going to call her Lizzie or Liz. It's kind of like a nickname. And this is what we kind of have here with you. It's really Judas. But it's the way we should, the way we should, this is how the phonetic uh, way to say it is E-E-O-O-D-A-S. Yodas. Y'all looking at me like a mule looking at a new gate. Okay, now, one of the things I want to go to, there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of, if you went through every commentary in, in your e-sword, my sword, whatever one you want to go, everybody's got a basic different idea who this guy is, okay? But primarily, there is a listing of eight individuals in the Bible by the name of Judas. Okay? One is the fourth son of Jacob, Judah. Number two is an unknown ancestor of Christ. Number three, a man surnamed the Galilean, who at the time of the census of queerness excited a revolt, a revolt, an uprising in Galilee. That's in Acts 5 and 37. There was a certain Jew in Damascus in Acts 9:11 who was called Judas. And five, there was a prophet, Judas, who was called Barsabbas of the church at Jerusalem in Acts 15 and 22 and Acts 15 and 27. The sixth was the apostle 
in John 14 and 22. I, I, I'll read these in a moment. Who was surnamed Lebius, or his last name was Thaddeus, and according to a opinion, okay, you like that word, opinion, is the one who wrote this book. The other is the half-brother. Now you got to understand how I said this is the half-brother of Jesus in Matthew 13 and 55. And then we always know there was Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Now one of the things, I, I could go through all of these scriptures and, and read them, but as we open up this book, as we begin to take a look at this book, Let's take the thought that there's a great possibility the one who wrote this book was the half-brother of Jesus. There's a couple reasons why. The half-brother of Jesus was not one of the apostles. Okay? There's nowhere in this book that this individual identifies himself as being one of the apostles. But, there's another point to be made. The second phrase he says, a servant of Jesus Christ. Are you listening? I don't really believe that the apostles are like the so-called prophets and apostles of this day who always love to title themselves. Just because you got a gift of prophecy, everybody's got one. They just don't function. Can I back up a little bit? If you have living inside of you the prophet, the priest, and the king, you have in you... Are you all listening? If you allow him to speak through you, Got quiet in here on me again. But the issue is if you allow him to speak through you, you can function in the gift of prophecy, but you don't have to identify yourself by that. You can just say, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He speaks to me and through me. I serve him by speaking. I serve him by doing. I serve him by that. Are you listening? I can go into many scriptures. I just finished reading, or I'm three quarters of the way. I just started again reading through uh, Matthew and Genesis at the same time in another translation. And one of the verses was that I just read was Jesus, they came to Jesus. Remember the story about the, the mother of James and John? They wanted, they wanted to know who was the greatest. They had this big discussion. You know, they're just like, who is the, we got this problem today. Who's the greatest prophet today? Is it the guy with the biggest crowd? Or the most money? Ask Sister Friend, she just went through this thing about all the big name people and how much, how many millions they're worth. Are y'all listening to me? He starts this book with the theme of this book. The theme of this book is 
we're servants. We might be children. We might be sons and daughters. We might be all of that. But he said, Jesus said, that he that wants to be the top dog among you ought to be the servant of all. Are y'all listening? We get all of this idea, all this glamour position idea. Oh, if I could only pastor a church, I'd be in charge. Yeah, right. All you are is to serve the people that sat in front of you and are foolish enough to listen to you ramble on. Are you listening to me? This whole idea in this whole book is about being a servant. And Jesus showed him that issue just before he went to Calvary when he washed their feet. Jude, the servant, even if he was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, this shows me the theme of this book by him saying, I was his servant. My blood brother or half blood brother had nothing, I have nothing up, no, no positioning. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm here to serve. Are you listening? A servant of Jesus Christ. The next statement is one that gives me more the insight that he, he, he probably was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. The brother of James. We find that Jesus, um, the scripture says that Jesus, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, um, is it uh, Matthew? Uh, I know it's in Matthew. 23, 20, uh, oh, 23, 23, is it 23? Oh, no. <laughs> this is the other one I was thinking about. Let me read this one. Be ye not, but be ye not called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let me, uh, that wasn't what I wanted, but that was a good one. How uh, about 10? Did them, did them, did them, did them. No, I can't find it. But anyway, it, it, I wrote it down here, but I, I can't find my notes. Um, but Jesus had, I think, I think three other brothers and a sister. And they're listed. And so here we have the brother of James. And he writes this. Are, have we got this? Have we got the point? Have I got the point across? It has nothing. We do this all the time. And our, we always favor those that are our flesh and blood. 
he uses no thought here in the fact other than he just identifies himself not as the brother of Jesus but he identifies himself as the brother of James to them who he's writing to okay is all right we go on here I'm, I'm, I'm got a few minutes so I can just ramble on a little more so to them who are sanctified I like this word sanctified you can you can it, it basically means to be set apart we are what we are set apart what are you set apart for purpose but not your purpose Remember, we're servants. If we're serving the master, if we're serving the king, if we're serving the father, if we're serving, who are we serving? Him for his purpose. What's his purpose? You know, I, I, I get into my Sunday message. I don't want to get into my Sunday message, but Sunday message is, his purpose is so that the knowledge of the Lord will fill all the earth. But first, it's got to fill this earth before it'll get out of here to fill that earth. And that means I got to serve. To them that are sanctified. I wrote down in my notes here. That are set apart for his purpose. We're sanctified by God the Father. And preserved or kept or guarded. You know what? If you allow God to set you apart. So that you can serve him. This is what Jude is saying here. He's, he's saying, if you allow God to set you apart, he will preserve you. He will keep you. He will guard you. We are preserved and we are called. You know, for... Some of you, however you were brought up, I believe the scripture that whosoever will may come. I believe that. But you know what? I'd be absolutely God dead stupid if I thought God didn't know who will. Are you listening? If you're called, and God's give out the call. He knows who's coming. And he knows who ain't. Oh, I shouldn't use that word. That's not good English. Who isn't? You say, oh, it can't be that way at all. He couldn't be God then if he didn't know. No, he's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. That's, that's difficult for us to understand. How he can be here and over there at the same time. Wherever over there is. All of God can be here and he can be somewhere else at the same time. All of God. We can't understand that. We think we can only get a little bit. That's because we don't understand that dimension. I've always said this. We know the story of Philip. He's in the process of holding a revival meeting and God needed him over there with, the, with the, the Ethiopian coming up the road from Jerusalem. And so God just put Philip over there while he was over there. You say, how can that be so? 
Because if you're God-like, you can be like God. We just can't understand it. You know, I, I just... Okay. Here we go. Sanctified by God the Father, we're preserved in Jesus Christ, and we're called. Do you know what? You better make up your mind whether you're going to fully answer the call. Because God doesn't start you to have you stop somewhere along the line. The call has got the full purpose in it. Now, verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. I love this. This is not like Peter. You go over to Second Peter. We know the story over in Peter. You know, Peter says, add to your faith. And you add this, and you add this, and you add this, and you add this. And if you add all of that, you'll be fruitful. You'll never be barren. You'll have all of this. This is not what Jude is saying here. Jude is saying, God, multiply. Don't add, multiply. He wants him to multiply mercy and multiply love and peace. Are you listening? I don't know about you, but multiplication works. It works. It works. 18 grandkids, five greats, more on the way. How do you know? Because God adds mercy multiplication you say oh you're just being no that's all part of God's doing okay are you all right okay let's go to verse 3 beloved when I give all diligence to write you all diligence means I put absolutely everything aside. There's, there's nothing got in the way. It was no phone calls, no text messages, no whatever it is, no whatever emergencies. He said, I had to lay it all aside because God was in my heart speaking to me to give all diligence. That's what God wants out of all of us. When he speaks, when he orders, when he, when he declares to us, he wants us to lay absolutely everything. Oh, I got to No, you got to give all diligence. But when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, I love this. Do you, do you know something? You know every... Oh. I don't know who's texting me at this time of night, but they better stop it. Anyway. Um, I, I, you know what every one of you ought to do? I did this today. What you need to do, you need to do a word search in the New Testament on the word salvation and read every scripture and see if it doesn't enlighten your heart to some of the things. There are three major points of salvation. Jude here talks about common salvation. You know what common salvation is? That's what God calls us to. It doesn't mean it's weaker or lesser or anything. But it's what we all ought to have. Common salvation. Okay? But over in the book of Hebrews. Let me go over there. Over in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 
two. Let me read just a little bit here. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. That's all of chapter one. Give, give, be, give all diligence. Chapter one. The things we heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Say, how in the world is that ever going to happen? We just get busy doing our own thing. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, listen to this, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? No, I'm going to tell you how I used to see this. Three dimensions of salvation. Common is what you get when you're first born again. Get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and now you've got great salvation. Because don't tell me somebody who's got the power of the Holy Ghost working in their life isn't greater in their deliverance than the individual when they first come to the Lord. Okay? Chapter 5. Talking about Jesus and a Melchizedek order. Say Melchizedek is the order we want to walk in. Because it has no earthy foundation. Melchizedek, neither father nor mother, nor end of life. Jesus Christ is a priest after that order. Okay, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Verse 9. And being made perfect or complete, what made him complete? He obeyed unto death. He was made perfect. He became the author or architect of eternal salvation. What kind? Common, great, and eternal. Here we are. Three dimensions. He became the author of eternal salvation just because we believe. No. To all them that obey him. Serve him. So we got three dimensions of salvation. For we're certain, and here we go, Beloved, I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. What was it? That common salvation which was offered to all. It, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend. I like that thought. To earnestly contend means you'll fight to the death. You're not afraid to defend the very purpose of God in your life if it costs you your life. Got quiet in here. Oh my goodness. You want me to teach this, ver this book? That you should earnestly contend for the faith. What kind of faith was that?
What kind of faith was that? Earnestly content for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. I just went through all of this when we began this class today. There was a dimension of faith those people had in the first 50 years after Pentecost that turned the world upside down. I don't know about you, but I've been praying, Lord, I, want, I don't want to go back to Pentecost. That was just the beginning. But I believe that we've stepped over into a dimension of God. In a, in a, what's the word I want to use? Season. You know, I, I, we were singing that song, and, and, and in there, Peter was singing, and in that one song, it talked about a day. We always talk about a day of judgment, the coming of the Lord, and there's going to be a day of judgment. I got a question for you. I, I give you something to pray about. Is that a 24-hour day? Or is that a thousand year a day? Are, are you listening? The day of judgment, the, the coming of the Lord, is that, is that just, a, 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 um, you know, is he just going to pop out of the sky in, in a moment? Because that's the way we've been taught. The day of judgment, the, the day of the Lord. Okay, let's, let's take that statement. The day of the Lord. How long is that day? 24 hours? Because Peter says, a day of the Lord is, is a thousand years. You know how long a day with the Lord can be? As long as he wants it to be. You know, we live in daylight and darkness. Daylight and darkness. We got our 24-hour day, and there are days when we was, will this day ever get over with? And he's telling us we got to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That Paul declared that I was a man born out of due season and I'm contending for the day. Are you listening to me? I was a man born. I'm premature. Should we contend for the faith that's once delivered to the saints? That faith caused them to serve Lay everything aside to see what God wants produced. Amen? Well, it's 8.30, and I've covered the three verses. So I don't want to go to the earth. For certain men crept in on awareness. I don't want to go there. Not tonight. I'll get that next week. Okay? Love you. Love you. Danny, pray for us.